What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks. DJ Buck back with you. Buck, I see you. Uh, you're wearing the, the Granada Hills Charter Football shirt. I, I'm. A, I gotta tell you a great story. So we are. Uh, we're in Coronado. If those who don't know San Diego, oh, yeah. Coronado, I got the island over there. So we're going. Yeah. My wife and I are going to lunch. It's raining, um, and and we're walking, and I see this guy wearing a Granada Hills football sweatshirt. Huh. But a little bit older guy. And, uh, I, I, so I, I literally, I don't know why I didn't, I didn't even say like, hi, sir. I just said like, Hey, you know, Bucky Brooks and the guy just looked like he just seen a ghost. Like he looked at me. I actually think there might've been a language barrier there. And so he just kind of stared at me and then he just goes, no, I go, okay, hey, have a nice day. Have a nice day. I thought I was going to get, have this great interaction. Like this guy, it was like a Granada Hills football sweatshirt. I'm like, come on, so, man, what is Granada Hills football? Oh, that's funny, but I am not surprised that there would have been a language barrier because the majority of the kids that I coach, I mean, like we have all kinds, um, yeah. Asian Americans, uh, we have Middle Easterners. Uh, <laughs> we, I mean, just, it's a kaleidoscope of kids, Hispanic. Yeah. And so it's kind of funny. So I'm not surprised that you would see um, all different types wearing wearing the gear. Yeah. I thought you were going to say when you are at Coronado that you bumped into John Elway because I wouldn't be surprised if he is kind of oh, kicking it and hanging out. There. Just floating yeah. around, just just kind of doing yeah. what John Elway does as the king. Um, you send him fresh funny. gear? Like you get you get new gear I on a yearly basis. I haven't caught like I haven't I haven't caught up with him in a while. But yeah, I got a, I got a stack of stuff waiting for him. Whenever yeah. I can track him down, he's he's a uh, he's not the easiest to 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 find. But he has come through because um, a couple coaches went into the L.A. City Section Hall of Fame and he showed up. Uh, Daryl Stroh went into the Hall of Fame. His old coach, his old might have been his football and baseball coach went through. So he kind of showed through, showed up and went to the ceremony and those things. So that was a big deal. That was last, last year, I think when he came through. So it's kind of fun. Nice. Love that. Um, today on the show, we're going to, uh, we're going to hit on some of the top uh, debates, like mm -hmm. the closest graded players mm -hmm. that we have as we come down the home stretch here, uh, see if we can uh, shed some light on that. Uh, but I, I want to give you some breaking stuff that we've got right now, because I reached out to a, uh, actually it's from an assistant general manager. I said, Hey, I know Cooper DeGene had his pro day today. <laughs> Iowa I said can you get Woo. what because numbers get put out and I'm always like hey let me talk mm. to a team and get official mm -hmm. team numbers here. so this is the team numbers that I got uh size 6005 202 great size uh mm -hmm. 31 and an eighth arm he they had him at 446 and 443 with Oof. a 38 and a half vert a 10 4 broad a 152 and a 15510 um for one month uh healthy and training pretty darn good uh, uh pretty, pretty darn good i would say that is really really good and the reason why it's so good is because dj like it, it's funny because i still feel like it's it's out of sight out of mind right so we haven't seen him we didn't get a chance to see him at the combine really work out i think he's underappreciated uh i know you have him well up there in your top 50 i have him as my number one slot defender um on, in my top fives and the thing that is really impressive when you d dig down deep one he was a state long jump champion. So I'm not yep. surprised to see the numbers that he put out there because he's an explosive athlete. Two, when you go in, you study the tape and you see him bounce around. He does everything that a lot of times we project players to do. He does on tape. We see him play outside. We play him play corn inside nickel corner. We play him play safety. We see him return kicks. We see the speed and all the athleticism. To me, he is one of the safest prospects in terms of projecting what he's going to be at the next level because you see it all. And we have seen of late, we've seen these Iowa DBs come into the league and have success and stick and do all that other stuff. We know Kirk Ferentz runs a pro style program, man. I feel about as good uh, about Cooper DeGene as I feel about any prospect in this class. No, it's a good point. And I think it's a classic case of kind of out of sight, out of mind a little bit. He hasn't had a chance to go through the whole process, but this is a good closing argument that he's made here uh, coming down the stretch to go along with the tape from the beginning. I got one for you. So on path to the draft today, we were using the PFF mock draft simulator. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just kind of cool. going fun tool. So I was responsible for three team, two, three teams that had multiple picks. So the Bears, the Cardinals, and the Vikings. Mm -hmm. Somehow in the simulator, it went where Quinion Minshew went number eight to the mm -hmm. Atlanta Falcons. Okay. All the quarterbacks are going DJ at eleven with the Minnesota Vikings. Cooper DeGene is off the board. Like, Whoa. Yeah. Ahead of Terry and Arnold. Yeah. And so people may be surprised when they hear that, 
But I think they have to understand that nickel position and the versatility that he brings makes him a very valuable and a hot commodity. I'm not saying that he is going to be a top 15 pick, but if we were on draft night and it happened where he goes before we get to 15, I wouldn't be surprised. He checks off a lot of boxes in terms of his athleticism and production. So I want to hit you on the related question there because this is one of the challenging things in the role that we're in now versus the one we used to be in. Do you find yourself, and you do your top fives, I do the top 50. This is a, this is a challenge that I have of, look, our, I look at this in a pure scouting exercise, how I stack the players, what I think of the players. Mm-hmm. But as you get towards the end, I might, and you're the same way. We might not know which team is going to take somebody, but we know this player mm-hmm. is going ahead of that player. And yep. it's like, do you want to beat your chest and say, I had this guy as my top corner and he was the first corner off the board? Or do you stay true to the evaluation and say, I know this other guy is going ahead of this guy, but I like this guy better. And three years, four years from now, when we look back, I'm going to feel good about having this guy over that guy. That's a challenge <laughs> of this side of the business that I don't think people appreciate. Yeah, I think this is a big challenge, and I think it depends on how you want to play it. If you're staying true to your own scouting process or whatever, then you don't change it. You may make mention of because we always talk about the verbiage, right? Mm -hmm. So with your top 50, you have an opportunity to write a blurb about the player, Mm -hmm. why you have them there, whatever. In my top five, I have an opportunity to kind of scrimmage it out a little bit. But I try to because I feel like when I made those changes, they've come back to bite me. Yeah, Yeah, they've come back to bite me in the past when I've done it like so yeah i did it with I, I baker say, mayfield over josh allen i, I had josh allen over year. baker mayfield and i'm like baker mayfield's gonna be the first pick and i i, I, I you know not even I, consciously like subconsciously it messes you up well i i think last i know i did it last year with bryce young and cj stroud for most of the process i had cj stroud as my number one in the top five then at the end i flipped it i i mm-hmm. think sometimes it's a little of the fatigue being honest from doing tv yeah we talk about guys so much you end up having the same argument then before you know it that argument that you have kind of seeps into your conversation, mm-hmm. your evaluation and your writing. But if we're doing it the way that we would do it, if we're area scouts on the West coast or whatever region, you stay true to it. And you wouldn't worry mm-hmm. about how they come off the board. You would say, this is how I see the guys. This is my top five and I'm mm-hmm. sticking with it. hundred um, percent. I also would say sometimes while information can help you get a player, right. It can also mess you up. Mm -hmm. whereas I almost wish like when I first started doing this uh, 12 years ago on the media side, and you've been doing it longer than me on the media side, our, our, like, it's just part of our generation. So like we had a lot of connections with area scouts and guys that, Mm -hmm. you know, not many, like at the top of the ladder, Mm -hmm. as we now fast forward 12 years, all the guys that we've talked about, all our guys have gone up, all our guys are up. So we've got connections with all these GMs across the league and you can get inundated with information. And sometimes it's yeah. like, man, I almost wish I'd have been better off. Don't tell me about what this kid was like on the interview. Don't tell me, mm-hmm. you know, about this thing that may have happened in the past or whatever. It just clouds my my uh, picture a little bit versus just at the beginning. It was almost just like just pure. I like tape. Like, you know, this is just a tape. We would call them cross checks. So when you're with a team, for those that don't yeah. know, you have your area where you know the character. You, you've been in the school three mm-hmm. times. You know them inside out. But then you'd have cross checks tape only. You're not held responsible for anything this guy might have off the field, whatever. You're just watching the tape. That's what it used to be like, and I feel like now we almost got too much information. No, I, I, I'm I'm with you on that because, DJ, when it's really the, the pure form of just off tape, sometimes the evaluation is different. And because we have – look, let's be honest. The industry has, has exploded since we jumped into it, like the cottage industry of the draft and draft scouting and all that um, – Look, man, there are more people in the game now. There are more people making cut-up tapes that end up on YouTube. There's more uh, websites and content that you can consume where you you naturally see a lot of the information about a player that can impact and influence your grade if you're not careful. Uh, I think the best thing is, and look, some of this I got from you when you talked about the process in Baltimore, how you try you guys tried to have the notebooks all closed up by the time you got yeah. to the combine. I remember you talk about Phil Savage and how Phil Savage was always a, Hey, by the time we get to the workouts, yeah, we need this to be done because the only thing that's going to happen is we're going to be overly influenced by what we see in t-shirts and shorts, as opposed to sticking to the game. And I try to stay true to that, even though we have to keep making changes based on more information, more film, more this, 
but typically your first instinct is the right is the right one i'm i'm looking up some stuff here because i was curious on this as we're talking um let me find this last thing here 2020 let me go 2022 okay so do you remember uh the jalen hurts discussion that we had we got down to the very end yeah he had not been he had not been mm-hmm. in my um top 50 he, he had not been in my top 50 and then uh at the very end i was like okay i just at the end of the, i just he's the kind of guy i'm worried i'm gonna be wrong on like he's the kind of guy i'm worried that's gonna come back and bite me when it's when we look back on it i'm like he's just got such good wiring and such good makeup so last year i was trying to look at i believe it was jack campbell for me who went back i think i put him in the last one at like 49 uh mm-hmm. like 49 or 50 like right around there i was trying to i didn't see 22 but like just those guys you're like you know what all the information's there. Maybe I didn't have the grade that puts him there, but like I'm gonna allow some, uh, just allow some common sense of like this guy's got a lot of the traits to be a good player. So did it with Jalen Hurts, did it with Jack Campbell, and I was thinking about like who will be that guy this year. I mean, Melton might be one. I put him in there mm-hmm. in the in the most recent one, mm-hmm. but it's always interesting this time of year to go back through and say, okay, who the, who's the guy that I've said like, man, I love him in the third round, but then you're like, you know what? screw it i just i believe in who this guy's makeup is it might even be like a mike samer still mm. of like he's probably gonna go outside of the top 50 i would guess mm-hmm. but man the makeup's elite um the playmaking's there like maybe that's a guy that you just put in there it's so funny that you brought that up because you talked about max milk uh mm-hmm. dj i'm looking at my list of nickel corners and in order i have cooper DeGene, mikey samer still and then max melton like mm-hmm. bang, bang, bang. And then right after that is Kamari the Lasseter. And yeah. I think with all of those guys, the thing that you like is the temperament, the IQ, the instincts. Um, Kamari Lasseter ran slower than you wanted. Max Melton was super competitive. Sanders still just plays the position like a like a pro, you know, when you watched him in Michigan. I just don't think you can go wrong sometimes when you you buy into the high character guys that kind of show you that steady play. It may not be the flashiest, but they just kind of bring – you know exactly what you're getting. And I know we talk about uh, ceilings and floors, but, DJ, like, we talked about the business being, man, you, you you can win a lot of games if you hit doubles. You mm-hmm. don't necessarily have to hit a bunch of home runs. If you just hit doubles, good players that are just kind of solid uh, for what you do, you can, you can be okay. And I think sometimes those last guys kind of climbing to the top 50 are those guys that you just know, hey, man, this is just a double all day, every day. Um, one other, I'll give two other thoughts here real quick, uh, and then we'll take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll get into some of these draft debates. But, um, first one, I talked to uh, a bunch of executives over the weekend. The weekends are kind of a good time to connect because the guys mm-hmm. are in meetings all week. You can't really catch them. So the weekends I mm-hmm. talked to a bunch of guys around the league there. It's always intriguing to me who they ask about. Mm. And you know, the, the, the name that came up more than any other in a weekend full of conversations around the league was Graham Barton. Where's Graham Mm. Barton going? Mm. And I started thinking about it and I'm like, man, in an era now where, you know, I I think position flexibility up front with offensive line has never been more valuable. Yeah. Uh, And having a guy who literally is a five position player who's incredibly smart, who was playing center as a 17 year old freshman in the ACC, uh, you know, and has played tackle, he can play any of the positions. And I think. I'm just curious to see when it's all said and done. I would have said, if you'd asked me a month ago, I would have said, mm-hmm. like, Guyton and Mims, they're going to go ahead of, of yeah. Graham Harden. And I think what happens as we get to the end, people are like, man, those guys are really talented, and maybe next year they'd be top 15 picks, but there's just not a lot of starts. And then it's like, mm-hmm. Graham Barton is the double. It's like we get down to the end, and you're like, man, I don't, I can't miss. Like, Graham Barton is right in the fairway. So it's funny because I felt like I was I was crazy high on him, like going through it. I'm like, man, what's not to like? A guy plays five position. He has starts at at, at center, but he plays out wide at tackle. Yeah. Uh, you know that you can get him in the lineup. And let's just think about the times that we've worked for a team. And we're saying, coach, I know this guy's our third tackle, but can't we just put him in at guard? Like, like can't mm-hmm. we put our best five on the field? Kind of similar to you talk about, hey, let's just not have any tomato cans. And yeah. so with Graham, with Graham Barton, I think if you're a team that is stuck, who can we pick? You're like, well, you know, we can kind of take Barton and just kind of figure it out when yeah. we get when we get on campus. Like, the best five out there. 
yeah. and, and put our best five. That's what he offers that other guys. And I think we can say that JPJ, Jackson Powers Johnson, is a better center. Uh-huh. But the versatility that Barton brings makes it where you have to say, hey, he's going to go, he's going off the board first mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. there's so many different roles that he could occupy for a team. Yep. And uh, that that was one of the things that stood out to me. The other one was um, I was having this conversation and we were talking about the tight ends, right? And, man, it's hard to – we've said it. Bauer's trying to find a home for him just because people don't look at that as a value um, mm-hmm. because of what you can get free agent tight ends for and the gap of what you're going to have to pay for a tight end up high in the draft is not different. And this person said, have you seen what these defensive tackles are getting paid? Oh yeah, twenty they have to twenty three million. Because I was going through it, I'm like, man, I'm trying to find out like who can I be, who might I be a little low on, you know, like who who do I need to consider? Mm-hmm. And so I have like Byron Murphy's my nineteenth player. Okay, I don't think he's getting to nineteen, Buck. Um, I'm gonna probably I, move him up a little bit in my last one. That's again, I have the grade to support mm-hmm. it, but that's where I have him. I compared a bit all of them. Mm-hmm. And then the other one um, being Johnny Newton. So. And Johnny Newton, I think some people had him as a two, as like a second round pick. Some people thought 20s. And the 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 thought came to me when we were talking about how much money these D tackles were making. I was like, man, if I can get one of those two guys, really good players, Mm -hmm. I think Murphy's really, you know, pretty dynamic. Um, man, that's a value. Like versus what Mm -hmm. these guys are getting paid on these free agent contracts, Christian Wilkins and on and on, Mm -hmm. you know, Chris Jones, all Quentin Williams, on and on. We see all these guys Uh getting paid massive amounts of money. We just uh-huh. saw the dude from Carolina get a ton of money. Yep. <laughs> so, oh, Derek, Derek Brown just got paid. Yeah, like, money. over the week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, so if I'm if if I'm those guys, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And on the other side of it was, and I'm not. We don't ever do. We never do. Uh, you know, character assassination, or we never get into that. But man, Tavondre Sweat, what are you doing? What are you doing? So you get a DUI three weeks before the draft. What are you doing? DJ, so maybe it was oh, it was the path meeting today, and I was was telling the crew, one of the things that you do as an area scout when you're having these interviews like at pro day, like writing in, you're like, hey man, you have got to just just, hey, just stay out of trouble, like yeah, don't go out late. Like I've told guys, hey man, I know you guys are gonna go out, but hey, if, if it closes at two, leave at one. Like yeah. just right now for the next three months to the end of the draft, like just stay out of trouble and so for sweat to get a dui three weeks before the draft like i i think people have to understand for us to clean that up to investigate it and to do it we're now up against the clock because we don't know we don't have enough time to get all the information to figure out like hey is this a pattern of behavior that we we miss is is, how is this going to be adjudicated what what is he going to have to do and at some point dj you're sitting there and, and you're having this conversation with the, the higher ups and we're, we're going back and forth. You, and then finally you say, you know what, who's the next one? Let's move on. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens. And so for him, I mean, this is a major, major mistake. That's going to be very costly because the timing of it, yeah. not that you would ever condone it, but the time three weeks before no, and, Coming off of the thing where, man, like a week before that, you got Rasheed Rice doing something. So now you have all of this attention back on NFL players and their conduct. And the last thing that you can do is everyone, everyone knows this when you've been a scout. The last thing you want the owner to do is when they have to do that introductory presser. Yeah. You don't want him to stand up there and someone throws a question from left field that he is unable to answer. Yeah. And, and so Sweat has put himself in a position where you just won't take him because you don't want ownership or the general manager, anybody to stand in front of the podium and get hit with a, a question that blindsized him because we don't have all the information. No. And I look, I, I he's not in he, had, he was on my initial top 50 list and then I pulled him mm-hmm. and then you get to the senior bowl. He doesn't weigh in which however you feel about that, it's not a good look when you're the only person that I think of in history that hasn't weighed in at the senior bowl. Mm-hmm. So you've got at least history, you know, he's 300 close to 370 pounds. So I've got, 
I'm like, man, am I going to have to worry about this guy showing up at 400 pounds? And it's like, no, no, he's mature. He's grown up. Da, 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 da. And it's like, well, this is not helping my case here. And is in, as we both know, having been in the draft room, I don't care what player it is. There is always a for and against argument in that room. It might be mm-hmm. 10 guys for and one against, but there's never con- consensus across mm-hmm. the board. There's always another mm-hmm. opinion in there. And that case just became that case closed because you're not you're sitting in there as a scout. Say you say you're the area scout. You've got a big grade on him, and we've got a role we can do it. And you get pushback, pushback. We've been in that room, Buck, and you mm-hmm. know you know it as well as I do. There's that moment where you go, "I'm gonna fall on the sword on this one, guys. You guys, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dying on this hill. You guys nope. put him where you're gonna put him. I'll fight my I'll save my bullets for another battle, but I'm not I'm not fighting that one anymore for another one because the character thing. And so now we talked about so. We talked about the defensive tackle class, and I was going to bring this name up because you saw him at the Senior Bowl. But now, like a guy like Brandon Dorless, he now has dude. Been- dude, he's going to go, man. He's right talking to coaches. He's going to go, and so, I went back so, and did more on him. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, because I, I wrote down in my notes because I, I was going through. I was like, well, you know, he's big, powerful defensive tackle. You see the Senior Bowl one on ones, and he is out here uh, drop stepping and spin moving on folks like he's a post yeah. player. And he has a lot of power. He has a lot of stuff. And then you looked at the numbers from the combine that are fairly impressive. DJ, like it, it opens up the door. And and you talk about Johnny Newton, Byron Murphy. You talk about Doralis. You can talk about Chris Jenkins. Um, I have Darius Robinson because he goes inside and outside. Yeah. But there, there are guys that are going to be valued because everyone is looking for that interior player that can give you some pass rush, that, that he can give you that penetration, he can give you a little disruption on the inside there's value in those guys and with the numbers going up at that position where you're getting guys that in the hot look the 20s 22 23 24 million dollar annual mark um yeah you can look to see if you can replace some of those guys with draftees yep uh that's a great point i'm glad you brought up doorless too because i had <clears throat> he's a tweener right he's played inside he's played outside he mm-hmm. worked out at the combine with the dns and i remember th- like yeah he had a great combine workout but his numbers had been compared with the DNs. When you kick his numbers to the DTs, and Nagy, uh, our buddy Jim Nagy, uh, with mm-hmm. the receiver, tweeted that out the other day. Like, man, you stack him up with – he's like top three in every metric. And then I was talking to a coach the other day, and he was like, man, he's like, why is nobody talking about this doorless? Like, mm-hmm. I'm like, well, I have a solid grade. He's just outside my top 50. But then all this confluence of information, right, the value mm-hmm. of the position, this guy being a DT and not a DN, then it's just like now you get the sweat. Like sweat, he was above sweat already for me. But then the mm-hmm. sweat thing happens. It's kind of, I feel like a lot of attention's gone to this position, and I feel like he's a guy that late, late here in the process, especially as coaches, mm-hmm. as coaches get into the mix. Um, I'm glad you brought that name up. Look, he 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 he's one of those guys. I, I had in my notes. Um, I'm looking at him like, man, this 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 is one that we have to kind of talk about. But there were some other guys that you talk about uh, a a bit of a cluster but uh, do you want to take a break before we do it yeah let's let's take take a a quick break break and we'll get into some of these clusters we'll do that right after this all right buck we uh we teased it here uh about some of these debates i'm going to go through some of the positions Mm -hmm. and i'm going to give you what i think at least personally for me have been the um this guy versus that guy discussion okay and then just you know i'm not you don't need to pick um i'll tell you who how i have who over who but i Mm -hmm. i'd love to just get your thoughts on them it's a good healthy dialogue you ready to go cool let's do it all right uh we'll start at corner uh a good one for me is um here we go i've got cooper DeGene at 25 mm. i've got rake straw at 28 Oof. now in cooper DeGene's favor he just ran so he ran faster he ran in the mid four fours we talked about that earlier he's mm. 20 he's 20 pounds heavier than rake straw um so that's i mean and then rake straw look i would i was hoping he'd have a better process uh just in terms of the testing stuff i still think he's a really good player but i have cooper DeGene three spots over him and then um the other discussion would be cooper DeGene versus nate wiggins uh which might mm. even be one so i have i have them six spots apart on my top 50 list but let's just do that one because i think even though I love Rake Straw, I think it. I think those other two guys are going to go ahead of him. Uh, from Cooper DeGene versus Nate Wiggins, where do you stand on that one? Okay, so we just had this conversation about Cooper DeGene. I was still leaning towards DeGene. The mm-hmm. one thing about Nate Wiggins, uh, I would say that is in his favor. The speed and the athleticism is terrific. I would say 
the instincts and the awareness. You see him make plays. You see the effort occasionally on tape. He ran down a couple guys and knocked the ball out. That was North Carolina play stands out to me the way he ran it down and pu- punched the ball out of a Amari and running back from North Carolina, punched it out in the end zone. That stuff is great. But easier. But then I sit here and I think about, and it's not fair, but it's one of the things that you do as a scout. I think about Emmanuel Forbes' struggles last season, his rookie year in Washington, slender frame, light. Uh, mm-hmm. I think about the 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 way the Kansas City Chiefs secondary tackled and tackled well mm-hmm. um, and why that was a big part and why they won. And I have questions and concerns about Nate Wiggins, not only his tackling, but maybe his willingness to kind of come up there and, and get after it. Yeah. To, to me, I tend to go with the other player because we see too often, man, if you're a bad tackler or an unwilling tackler, man, the ball finds you and it, it hurts you because those big plays cost you games. So I would go with DeGene in there. I think DeGene's a, a more physical player. He's more versatile, more dynamic. I would I would go with him. Yeah, I have uh, I have DeGene as well. And I'm sticking with uh, Rake Straw over Wiggins, but I think, you know, Wiggins is going to so, go away. So, so here's the thing that, that we would have like Wiggins goes where he goes, but the comparison between him and Rickershaw, I'm looking at my notes toughness, tenacity, technique. He's a coaching coach's dream as mm-hmm. a standout cover corner with superb tackling skills. Just a physical player, aggressive, but plays with that control fury that you like. To me, I'm go- I don't think you can ever go wrong with a tough guy. And if yeah. you have tough and in- toughness and skills, I'm gonna lean in that. I think the question for Wiggins, and he'll have to show this when he gets into the league, will he be tough enough to be more than just the old school one dimensional cover corner um, that he kind of projects to be right now based on his tape? Yeah, my comp for him was DRC uh, for Wiggins. You know, a good Donald player, Roger, Marty. Great player. DRC was a great player, fast, athletic, all yep. that. Um, all right, let's switch positions here. Uh, I'm going to go to. All right, I'm going to go to the safety position here. And these, I don't have a safety in my top 50. So I'm going to give you two names, uh, put them side by side, who I have touching each other. Uh, but Jaden Hicks from uh, Washington State had a good pro day today. Mm-hmm. Cole Bishop, who blew it out at the combine. Those are the two that I have touching each other on my sequence list. So Jaden yeah. Hicks from Washington State, Cole Bishop from Utah. I mean, both of those guys, because the first thing that stands out to me is just the athleticism, the physicality from both. Uh, mm-hmm. As I'm looking at them, DJ, I know we're talking about them as position players. I'm trying to figure out which one would be the more impactful special teams player. Mm-hmm. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't know, man, maybe Cole Bishop stands out to me, maybe because he was the last one that I watched. But there's something about him that stands out to me in terms of being a guy that can be a two-phase player, someone that is solid in the rotation in the secondary, but someone that immediately makes his mark as a special teams player. I like to watch the state kid, too. But if you had to ask me right now, I kind of lean towards the Utah standout. Yeah, I thought I ended up having Washington State over him by one. Again, they're touching each other. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. it's interesting when I go through my notes. I had questions about um, Hicks and his play speed when I watched him. Now he timed fine, so that's not mm-hmm. an issue. I love the rugged way that he plays. Excellent blitzer. Um, he's got good ball skills, takes good angles, good tackler. Uh, whereas Cole Bishop was kind of always just like Johnny on the spot. Like I thought he was super explosive. I love that he directs traffic. Um, he's the communicator out there. They use him as a robber. He can cover tight ends. It's kind of funny because they're not my top 50. So I haven't done like the deep, like the deep comparison. I got to put my 150, my final 150 together and I'll go beyond the 50 and really do these, this digging. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's one of those deals where this is helpful when you write your notes and you go back through and go through them is I can look at it and say, okay, I have Hicks over Bishop, but when I read them and you have the discussion, I'm like, you know what? They read Bishop different. reads better than Hicks does. So, again, <laughs> that's probably why this is healthy to do this stuff. And so I think people have to understand. So the listeners understand. So as a scout, one of the things that you do is uh, you go through and uh, when you're on the road, you have a computer program that has all these things. It has all your critical factors. Uh, then it has your position-specific things that you talk about each position. And then there's a a part where you have a summary. And so that summary is kind of like your one liner, what you really feel about the player. And if you're doing it the right way as a scout, you try to do that the same day that you see the player. So if Mm -hmm. I go to Utah today, tonight, when I get to the hotel, I want to write that out. And sometimes what happens is you may have a level of fatigue after you've been on the road for a while Mm -hmm. and you, you know, you kind of, I won't say you get lax, but your grades are, 
are different. And then when you go back and read, you're like, man, when I read, I really like this guy. I don't know why my grade doesn't mm -hmm. reflect how it reads. And so that's why reading the report is so different because sometimes coaches and general managers will hear you read the report and they'll say, like, I know you have that grade up there, but this guy reads a lot better yep. than that guy. John Fox was always auditory like that. He would hear you read the report. He was like, I hear what you're saying with the grade, but what I heard <laughs> it is sounds this a little player. different. Yeah. Sounds a little different. It happens. Yeah, hundred um, percent. All right, I've got uh, here's a fun one for you. DTs. Uh, Johnny Newton is thirty mm -hmm. second for me, and I've got Braden Fisk is at thirty eight. So between mm. those two defensive tackles, I, I lean towards mm. Newton. Uh, just a violent hands. Uh, mm. He's an excellent finisher. He's kind of got a little more polish. Whereas Fisk, I think, is more explosive. Uh, he can, you know, play on edges, shoot gaps, um, you know, those things. But again, very close. Uh, good conversation. Good debate. Yeah, good debate. And I'm with you on it. I would go with Newton over Fisk. Uh, if we let's wipe away the combine, right? Because I think the thing about Fisk and the combine, it can it can filter into what you think that he can be at the mm -hmm. next level. When we just go off the tape. Johnny Newton is more active, more disruptive. He plays hard, too. The energy yeah. that he displays. Um, not that Fist doesn't play hard, but I think sometimes it's easy to get influenced by the – look, the, he, he put up spectacular numbers at the con. Mm -hmm. But I can't say that the impact production matches the athletic stuff that we saw on tape. So Newton is a better player than me off the tape, so I would continue to stick with Newton over top of Fist. Okay, let's keep it. Let's keep it moving here. Uh, let's go to some edge guys. Um, well, I mean, shoot, I can go right at the very top. I mean, where it's 12, 14, 16, Dallas Turner, Jared Verse, Leatu Latu. I mean, and I've talked to a bunch yeah. of teams about this, and mm -hmm. the orders are all over the map. And I've, to me, there's an answer. One of the answers I got was, you know, a division, what division you're in. Like, hey, look we're in a division where they run the ball and it's physical and Jared verse is he's for us. Like he's going to set the edge. Mm -hmm. He's going to play violent and physical. It's going to have some bad weather. Like he, he works for us. Mm -hmm. Whereas other teams are like, look, we're in the dome. We're, we're inside. I need juice. And Dallas Turner's got all the juice. So I'll, I'll go with the Dallas Turner. And then you have, then you have the other people who just say, Look, I just need the best pass rusher. We we have an explosive offense. Mm -hmm. I need the skilled pass rusher, and Latu is the best pass rusher of the bunch. Great debate, God! What a great conversation. Um, so as I have them, uh, I have Turner, Latu, and Verse in order mm -hmm. in terms of preference. If you ask me, of the three, who's the better pass rusher? I would put Latu number one, um, and then look. Uh, like I would say Latu number one. I think you could say verse number two, then Turner number three. Yeah. And then Turner has some other stuff. Here's what I would say about Latu. Medicals have to be checked out. Having been around like great pass rushers, there is something that he does when I see him that I'm like, oh, he has it. It's the first step quickness. It's to get off. DJ, he can go from the right or the left. He can do it from a three-point or stand-up position. He can win with force or finesse. He has multiple pitches in the bag. He's nonstop when it comes to the motor. And I, I'm partial to this. When we talked to him at the end of the fall, we talked to him on the pod. And mm. his ability to articulate. Oh, it was on the uh, Senior Bowl show, I think. Yeah, yeah. His, his ability to articulate his pass rush plan and how he goes about it, really impressive. So I lean towards him. If it's a guy to have a pass rusher, I would go his way. Jerry Burst, yep. I love the power and explosiveness. Dallas Turner, I think he had, he probably is the best combination player. But if you want the pass rush, I think Latu is the guy. Yeah, and that's why, like, to me, it's all different. Like, if I asked you, if I said you're the Atlanta Falcons, I mean, I think Dallas Turner, I can, I can make that case easy. Like, he fits mm -hmm. them to a T. Mm -hmm. Um but if you ask me about the Baltimore Ravens, I'd be like, well, Jared Verse is a ra that's a Raven. I mean, that's, that's how they play. Rugged, that's, physical, that's overwhelm. You can bully, bull in the China shop. Yep. That kind of beat you, you up. Know. Yeah. Uh, um, so that's why I think those, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we don't have the luxury of having a 
a philosophy or a team to scout for. So mm -hmm. it changes how how you uh, how you stack them. Um, all right, let's get it. Let's get a couple more here. Um, we've talked about the centers earlier, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over the interior offensive linemen. I'm gonna uh, linebackers. We've talked about a bunch on here, so I'm gonna get us I'm gonna get us right to a tackle debate real quick. And then, uh, and then we'll get out to some receivers I want to touch on here as we come down the home stretch. Um, Fashanu from Penn State, J.C. Latham versus, versus Alabama uh, for Alabama. So I have uh, Fashanu is 15 for me. Uh, J.C. Latham is 18 for me. So that's there's two different uh, Lyman debates I want to get you on. So that's the first one: Fashanu, Penn State, Latham, Alabama. The next one is one I feel like is these guys have been neck and neck. They're touching each other on my sequence list. That's Mims and Guyton. Mims from Georgia. Uh, Guyton from Oklahoma, but let's start first. Penn State, Alabama. Where do you come down on that one, Buck? Okay, um, some of it depends on what you're looking for. I would say this: the 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 projection. Uh, Fashano is probably a better projection, just in terms of like you fall in love with the athleticism and those things. He's built like he looks like a natural left tackle. Right mm -hmm. now, I would say J.C. Latham to me is a better player. The mm -hmm. physicality, the toughness. Uh, he has patience. He's a right tackle, but I think he has the combination of the people mover stuff that I want while also showing the balance to be solid on the right side. For Shanu, and, and we used to talk about the left tackle being more marquee than the right. I don't know if we can still have that debate, but he looks natural. But he has some things that shows up that you're just like, oh, mm -hmm. I just wish that you could finish all the time. I think he's still a work in progress. Whereas I feel like Latham is a little more polished and a little more ready to play right now if we had to play a game today. Yeah, it's a tough one. I have Fashanu just over him, as I mentioned, but um, you got power on Latham's side. I think Fashanu is a more polished pass protector at this point in time. I think I'd like to see him be more violent, finished guys. I don't think he was totally healthy this year on that mm -hmm. side of it. Um, but, you know, it's Latham was the. He was the cat's meow as a recruit for a reason. He was the dog. He was the guy. <laughs> yes. Uh, because it's just the, 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 not many built like that. Um, so I, I can understand either, either argument there. I think, again, if I'm a team that has a left tackle in place, I'm going to want J.C. Latham to plug and play at my, as my right tackle. Oh, if I've, got, to, yeah, if I've got a hole at left tackle, I could say maybe I can lean more towards Fashana. So, again, it comes down to the team. It comes down to the team, and that's also why it's important we talk about like need not being the driving force, but when it's close, then need comes into it. You mm -hmm. know, like that's when the need happens to fall into place. But this next one is interesting. You talk about yeah, Guyton. Nims and Guyton. Where you go? Oh, man. I like, think it's 13 starts versus eight starts. I think that's what oh, the number is. I know. So. Um, Mims is just massive, man. Just like, yes, he is. just extra, super extra large, but he has the athleticism. I mean, just the raw ability that you just, okay, man, if we can just get him to go. Uh, I think Guyton is probably more ready to play today. Like, even though he has some stuff yeah. that he has to clean up, that system where he had a lot of reps, like them throwing the ball and doing all that other stuff, to me it still comes down to, like, schematic fit style. But I would go with Guyton over Mims, which is funny because I have Mims in my top five, not so Guyton. But it's – I would say if we had to pick, <laughs> I think yeah. Guyton is probably more ready to play. Yep. I, I have it the exact same way. So I have Mims one spot over Guyton, but, and then I got one more update to go here. And, uh, and that's what I'm constantly looking at. And I had this conversation with somebody over the weekend and we were talking about that. And he said, look, tomorrow's not promised. Today is like, I need somebody I can, I, who, who wears the trust meter basically. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if you phrase it that way, I would give Guyton the edge over Mims. Mims has, hasn't posted. He just hadn't been out there. I think he's got – I think Mims has more in his body. I think Mims could be – his. I mean, the, both these guys have crazy high ceilings. They're both almost six foot eight. You know, uh, mm -hmm. you got Mims is 340, Guyton's 320. I mean, they're, they're, they're mammoth human beings. But I think Mims has more – there's more in his body than Guyton has in his body. But right now we got to go play tomorrow. I need somebody to start 17 games next season and play winning football. I think I would probably, I would probably flip it and I would probably lean towards Guyton in that scenario. Yeah. I think, I think Mims is a, a little more of a luxury. You know, Mims would be great. He'd be great with the Philadelphia Eagles because how they oh, for a year. Oh, he, the coach was, Oh, kidding me. Stoutland yeah. would have him rocking and rolling. You know what I mean? Like he would be a, no need to play right now. We 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 get guys a year early. We're gonna mm -hmm. 
make sure you know how to play before you do it. And then big fella, we're going to get you ready to go. Um, yeah. In a situation where we need to play, we got to play right now with one. You're guiding to me. I think you can get away with what he does. And even his, his flaws right now are, are, are coachable and fixable. I think he is more ready to play. If we had to kick it off week one, I would go with Guyton over Mims. Yep. Uh, I love it. We've talked about running backs a bunch uh, previously. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to skip over tight ends as well. We got a little bit of time, uh, a little time we have remaining. I want to hit you on a uh, two wide receiver uh, uh, mm -hmm. questions here guys that i have really close to each other. let's start with this one to me this is the main event this is a fun one and it ain't it ain't the guys up at two three four we've talked about mm -hmm. them forever um i'm talking about my 34th player is lad mcconkey my 35th player is xavier worthy where would you come down on that one buck Oof. so it's very similar to um the conversation we were having about the tackles what do we need right now um Lad McConkey to me is, is very easy to slide in and put him in 11 personnel at the slot and go to work. He's a great route runner. Uh, he does all those things that you look for. And when he came in studio, he came in studio last week and had a chance to talk. DJ, you know how we fall in love with the, the, the high mm -hmm. IQ guys that are craftsmen. We've said it time and time again, those guys play. Xavier Worthy, the, I mean, Xavier Leggett. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what you said, right? Like, no, Leggett, no, no, Xavier Worthy. I had Xavier Worthy oh. from my Texas. Okay, so Xavier Worthy. So now Xavier Worthy is interesting because of the, the vertical stretch, like mm -hmm. what he what he brings or whatever. I've seen this comparison. It made me pause. Deshaun Jackson comparison in terms of Yeah, I think I use stuff. Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. Um I think McConkey's a better player. Yeah. I like the the stuff that Worthy brings as a vertical playmaker, but I think it's really important that we put him in the right role to maximize what it can be. McConkey, I think the role doesn't matter as much. We put him on the field. To me, he finds a way to be successful. He finds a way to give us five, six catches a game just because of his his polish. Mm -hmm. I think if I was, I have McConkey one spot over him, but I can make the case either way. If I if I have a higher grade on Xavier Worthy, my my argument in the in the draft room is simple. It's like guys. There's guys on here that are going to catch balls. There's guys on here that are going to get touchdowns. There's guys here going to get third downs. But which player can we draft that will benefit our quarterback, our run game, and all the other receivers, even if he does not touch a football? If we don't throw it to him one time, his feet, his speed will be felt every single down. He's going to scare safeties out of the box, which is going to help our run game. He's going to free up room in the middle of the field for our tight ends because he's going to blow the top off coverage. So even before he catches a pass, Xavier Worthy is going to have an impact on our team. That would be if I was going to make the case for him in the draft room, that'd be my argument. And I believe that. So here, here's the thing that we do know. When you put up combines fastest man, no matter what, it makes its way into every defensive scouting report. Mm -hmm. Every DB that lines up opposite him, they know that he is fast. That forces you to back up. That that You have to give him a level of respect just based on the time. Uh, I had a college coach who wasn't even an offensive coach, but a defensive coach uh, kind of tell me early. He said, even if you struggle with hands or whatever, he said, when you have that kind of speed, if we throw it over the top of the defense two times a game, that's 14 points. Mm -hmm. That right there is worth the price of admission. So there is something to that part of it. And it's just really about casting him in the right role so he can he can utilize his speed and be the threat, not only vertically, but horizontally to create problems and force defensive coordinators to account for him on every down. Yep, and I, look, Worthy had some drop issues the year before, caught it better this year at McConkey. I, I have him over him just because he's a better, I think he's a better overall player, can do everything. Um, again, he needs to uh, he needs to stay healthy and post um, consistently. If he does that, I have no doubt in my mind he's going to be a really good player. All right, last one. I mentioned I'll give you two here. Uh, mm -hmm. This next one, my final one, I have Malachi Corley uh, from mm -hmm. Western Kentucky at 45, and I have Roman Wilson from Michigan at 47. Oh. Uh, so between those two guys, se separate those two. Oh, man, what a good one. What a good one. I mean, really, really this good. This is fun. This is what we do in the draft room, too. If you're listening to this going, God. like, okay, like, so, what's it like inside the draft room? This is it. This is at this point in time. Guys, we've got the bulk of our board set, but there's a couple ties we need to break here. So let's have the discussion. Okay, so this is, this is funny. So I'm looking at my list. I have Wilson over top of Corley. Mm -hmm. But then I'm reading the report 
and it's weird. So I say Wilson, perfect blend of speed, quickness at the position, impeccable timing as a route runner, reliable option as a designated chain mover. Corley might be the most natural slot receiver in the class. <laughs> Outstanding runner with the ball in his hands. Terrific balanced body control running through arm tackles on bubble screens and quick routes. Oof. So I have Wilson over top of Corley, but I would probably take Corley over Wilson. Yeah, that's what I – I have Corley over Wilson. The, the, I just think he, the one thing the he ball, does, he ball. does something better than anybody else in the draft. That means something. Yeah, I mean, he is he is fantastic. I mean, he is he is fantastic in the slot. The way he works around and gets busy, he he can do it. And I really like Roman Wilson. Roman Wilson is tough and he's competitive and all that, but Corley has just a little something, which is so funny that I have him ranked literally one spot ahead of, of Corley, but then I read I read the summary and I'm like, oh, I kind of it sounds like I like the West Virginia, Western Kentucky guy a little better. Um, I'm looking this up here real quick. Okay. So let's say, man, be too early there at 34. But I, to me, like if I'm Washington, Washington has 36 and 40, right? So they pick second. Let's say they take whatever Drake may Jaden Daniels, whoever, mm -hmm. whichever quarterback they pick, um, they pick 36 and 40. I, to me, I'm taking one of those and I'm moving back and getting extra picks. Like that's, I, I don't need to pick 36 and 40, but if mm -hmm. I can get, if I can get, you know, trade from 40 to 46, 40 to 50, 40 to 55. Um, man, I have a young quarterback. Malachi Corley gives me three to four easy completions every game. I can freaking, I can, I can jet sweep him. I can, uh, I can throw him bubbles. I can do, I, he's going to give me three to four easy ones a game. Well, think about how we now can, can fill out the wide receiver court. Scary Terry McLaurin on one side, Jahan Dotson, former first round pick on the other side. You have Corley working in the slot. We have quick run after catch playmakers. Um, and for a guy in particular, like a Jaden Daniels, who really excels at the intermediate thing where we can get it out. We're going to let those playmakers run. Yeah. It kind of works because we talk about it with, with your quarterback. You got to make sure you build your offense and the personnel around the quarterback to its talents. Mm -hmm. And, that would be the thing that uh, AP and, and Dan Quinn have to do. they got to make sure that they have the talent around the quarterback that they pick to allow him to be at his best. Yep, 100%. Uh, well, this has been fun, man, fun discussion. Buck, I know you uh, you got more work going on today. you got to get to it, man. But uh, this, was a, this was a fun one, man. Anything else you want to add before we jump out of here? Love these conversations. This is what it would be like. This would be, as, we, as, as guys are coming back into the meeting room those last couple of weeks before they get into the draft, these are the conversations that we have on the daily trying to finalize and kind of like button up that draft board. It's about making sure that we have the players stacked in the right order. So when it comes to draft day, we don't have to have any hesitation or reluctance making a pick. No doubt. Um, hope you guys have enjoyed it. It's been fun uh, for us having this discussion. We'll keep you, uh, we'll keep you going here as we get towards a draft with these, uh, with these draft debates and, uh, and we'll let you know whatever information that we're hearing as we go forward. So uh, that's going to do it for us today. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. Appreciate you. If you can leave us a rating and a review. Uh, we love those. Uh, appreciate it. If you do that for us and uh, we'll see you next time right here on move the sticks.